Well, I have some news. I have some good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? Bad? Boy, you guys are pessimistic. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, the bad news is this about church. Uh, there's been growing sentiment in Christianity today that identification with the body of Christ is not really that important. It's been going on for many years. And those who loosely affiliate themselves with, quote-unquote for them at least, for church, uh, they keep an arm's length through three key areas. And those three areas are connected, but yet for these people they are at the same time disconnected. And those three areas are attendance, baptism, and membership. And so in the thinking of these people, which fuels this quote-unquote de-identification, uh, is that a personal relationship with Jesus is all that matters. That's it. And so before you shoot the messenger, uh, we would agree with that. And uh, definitely beyond a shadow of doubt uh, that we would exalt Christ, we, we would agree that without Christ's salvation, a personal relationship with him uh, is meaningless. And so one's relationship with Christ is always at the forefront of who we are as believers when we are speaking about the importance of the church because it is Christ's church. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to just review a previous sermon from August last year. If you were with us at that time, it was titled Assembly Required, so hopefully you remember that sermon. And today's sermon is related to uh, it, and I encourage you to go back onto our website, uh, refresh your memory, listen to that again, perhaps this week or today, uh, so that you'd really take heart uh, to God's word and to be spiritually disciplined with church. In the sermon assembly required, we look at these passages. And the first one was uh, Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24, giving us a sense of the doctrine of the church. And this passage gives us the, the seven experiences that we corporately encounter in the corporate meetings if we are pursuing the spiritual discipline of church. And Hebrews 12, in that section, verse 22 to 24, states this. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So if all of this in this verse, is, and it's loaded with, with so many things here, if all of this is a picture of all the blessings that is experienced uh, through the spiritual discipline of church right now, because verse 22 uh, it still has relevance to us, it says, you have come. This is what we have come because of Christ, too. And so the question is, shouldn't we desire this immense reality regularly as a normative pattern of one who is born again to sincerely long for these seven blessings from Christ found through the spiritual discipline of church? And here are the seven. To faithfully come into the blessings of the heavenly city, verse 22, to be in the ministering presence of thousands of angels, also verse 22, to be rejoicing in common membership as the church of the firstborn, verse 23, being in the humbling presence of God the judge, verse 23, experiencing the perfect righteousness of, as one in Christ, verse 23, to be in the glorious presence and promises of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, verse 24, and also in that verse, and to have forgiveness because of Christ's sprinkled blood. And so we experience those things when we come to church, when we gather together as God's people. And that's a precious thing because of what Christ has done for us. 
Now, the second scripture passage in that sermon last year uh, calls us into the church is from Hebrews also, chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, and it says, And let us consider how, how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so this passage gives us the three non-negotiable instructions. And the first is let us consider how to stimulate one another. The second is encouraging one another. And the third is and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So do those two things over and over again is the third a non-negotiable instruction because Christ is coming. And so these three practical points apply us with the, the godly motivation to conform to the spiritual discipline of church fellowship, namely, as you see, the day drawing near. That is a reminder that our time on earth is, is limited. Every moment, even as, we, as you hear this sermon, the day of Christ coming is drawing closer and closer. And so it's a godly motivation for us to wake up if we are in spiritual slumber. And so this, this tells us is that these days between now and this very moment and the time that Christ comes back is, is that we need to be disciplined. We cannot live our lives undisciplined, but we live in the end times and Christ's return is imminent. So be steady and be ready. And therefore, knowing the doctrine of the church should help us to understand how much we need the church. It is through Christ's church that you owe the shaping of every aspect of your life when you are all in. It is in the local church where we are elevated in corporate worship. Our souls are fed by the word preached. We are refreshed by the fellowship of the saints. We share in the remembrance and celebration of the Lord's Supper. We are transformed by discipleship through the mature saints. And we gain a growing passion for the lost through carrying out the Great Commission. And so we are here to remind ourselves and to remind each other, to encourage one another in these very things. And so it is that we must, with the deepest commitment aided by the Holy Spirit, that we are to support the church and we are to be all in because the church belongs to Christ who died so that the church might be born because you are born again in Christ. And so hopefully this gives you a, a good primer for this morning's installment of Spiritually Disciplined, the series that, as it, this morning it pertains to church. And so as we begin to look at the church and, and your relationship to it, uh, let's take some time to look at number one, and that is the threats and patterns of those who are not spiritually disciplined regarding church. If we are concerned about Jesus, then we are to be concerned about the church. The two cannot be disconnected. And this church which Jesus Christ ordained through his advent, his sinless life, his death on the cross for our sins, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, and ascension, and in the future he will rapture his church. It belongs to him, and so church should be important to you. So that's the good news. You might be thinking, I told you the bad news, and you say, how come he didn't talk about the good? This is the good news. All those things that Christ has brought about because of his death. He's brought about the church, us. And yet we see a growing alienation of the church. The media certainly portrays it that way, and it is accurate. But they like to, they, they like to gloat about it. And it's to our shame. And here's one such headline from... A few years back, 2015, the National Post ran this title, quote, A God, question mark, 
That's complicated. Canadians hanging on to personal faith as organized religion declines. Uh, semi, uh, no, colon, uh, poll, and then end quote. So that was the title, long title. And in that article, as it pertains to Baptist churches, as we're a Baptist church, fellowship church, between 1971 and 2011, there was a decline in Baptist churches in Canada uh, from 3.1% down to 1.9%, which is a 38.7% decline of the poll's total population. Now, other denominations, Protestant denominations, also showed declines. And interestingly enough, as the, the true church, uh, well, uh, I mean, these polls obviously uh, include the, the true church, and then they include churches that are not part of the true church. But it's interesting to note that as the true churches, the ev evangelical churches have, in their membership, declined, uh, major world religions, interest in those religions have increased and significantly. And those in the poll that embraced that they quote unquote believed in God was 97%. And, you, and as evangelical believers, uh, we know that's not true. But that's the statistics out there. I have firsthand experience with such thinking. Um, I've personally met, I've talked with a number of people in the city, I've talked to people standing in the corner at 41st just outside Oak Ridge when it was open. Uh, well, I mean, it's still open, but when it was fully open and all the stores were there and with other believers from our church before, uh, just evangelizing, telling people about the Lord. And uh, one thing that I would do is uh, just kind of break the ice. Right? I, it's, I break the ice by saying I'm a pastor, so that's easy, right? So um, then I ask the person, I, so if I say, uh, instead of asking if they're Christian, I say, oh, do you go to church? And then uh, some people say no, obviously, and some people say yeah. So my follow-up question is, oh, uh, what church do you go to? And then more than not, that person would be standing there uh, silent for a while, sometimes saying, uh, 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 and they can't even tell me what church they, they say that they're going to, right? So it just tells me that they're not going to church. And so, these people, they profess to be Christians, but they don't attend church. And, and really, they do not want to have any meaningful connection to the local church body. Kent Hughes uh, refers to these people as, quote, ecclesiastical hitchhikers. Uh, that is, uh, church hitch hitchhikers. Uh, he continues and states, quote, the hitchhiker's thumb says, you buy the car, pay for the repairs, and upkeep the insurance, fill the car with gas, and I'll ride with you. But if you have an accident, you're on your own. And I'll probably sue you. So it is with the credo, uh, and, and Kent continues, so it is with the credo of so many of today's church attenders, you go to the meetings, and you serve on the boards and the committees, you grapple with the issues, and you do the work of the church, and pay the bills, and I'll come along for the ride. But if things do not suit me, I'll criticize, I will complain, and probably bail out. My thumb is always out for a better ride, end quote. And so this kind of thinking fits in quite well with how Canadian Christians' thinking has been shaped by our world. Uh, uh, it is a secular, consumeristic worldview. And we need to guard our hearts against that. And therefore, there, there arises a, a pick-and-choose mentality tied uh, to a lack of true biblical commitment. And we see that not only in this church, but probably in every single church, true church. In addition, if a local church offers a well-planned spectrum of ministries, these uh, ecclesiastical hitchhikers will attend one church for the preaching, another for a growth group, and another for emotional boost with a cool worship team. 
and so they will float from church to church to be served the diet that they feel that they deserve. And church hitchhikers often will reveal their de-identification with the local church in their language. The conversation could perhaps be something like this. Hey, Jill, where do you go to church? And Jill will reply, I go to, I attend. But when we think of that language, and I, I don't want to be, you know, picking on the language, but uh, my point is, shouldn't our, it biblically be our response, I belong to, I belong to OBC, or I belong to this church, I'm a, I'm a member of this church. And so there is an arising crisis in the spiritual discipline of church, and we've arrived at the playground uh, slide of, of churchless Christians, as Hughes states. And at the end of this slide, there's a forming, growing mountain of professed Christians that are church hoppers who have no real biblical accountability. They lack discipline and enter into no form of serious discipleship. And, and so no wonder, they, if they look at themselves in the mirror, they, they see themselves not growing the way that God has intended. So they hold on to the hope of membership in the invisible church, in eternal glory up here, you know, uh, up there and out there in heaven, but exclude or limit their participation in her local visible expression here on earth. And yes, there are these and many other areas which threaten and hinder your response to Jesus and his church. And so now let's move on and to acknowledge this. Number two, God's will for you. And God's will for you is to understand your continued relationship to and your ongoing part in his church. And so in contrast, here is the testimony and pattern of the early New Testament Christians. And it's taken from Acts chapter 2 verses 41 and 47, and I'll work through this text um, from the New American Standard Bible uh, for this part. And Pastor Tommy, as we've been going through Acts, as you know, if you've been part of this church for a while, uh, he's gone through this passage, and I would also encourage you uh, to make it your homework, you know, go back to the, the sermon I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, assembly required, and then also go back to this sermon on Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. It was actually three sermons uh, in this section that Pastor Tommy preached. And so do that. And yet, yet it's important for us to, for this morning, to re-examine this passage which reveals to us a very telling, God-glorifying reality and pattern for us. You know, if you want to know what church is about... You know, what is our responsibility? What is our privilege uh, by coming corporately to church? This is a, a good passage to go to. And it will help us to re-examine uh, what we're doing in regards to the spiritual discipline of church. Um, and so this early church was led by the apostles. It was attractive. It was healthy. It was captivating to the saved, and it was also uh, uh, very uh, attractive. It was very interesting to see this group of people to unbelievers at that time because of the heart of the church was our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let's spend a little bit of time and I invite you to open your Bibles if you have them to Acts chapter 2, verses 41 down to 47. And let's see why this church was the way it was. And as we go through this passage, may it challenge us to a deeper understanding and commitment and longing. This longing that we really need to be spiritually disciplined for church and ultimately for our Lord's glory. That's why we're here. He saved us. He has a purpose for us. And the chief end of man is to bring glory to God, to worship him. 
And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after Peter exposited the Old Testament scripture and he preached the gospel, declared Christ, this was the outworking of the people's response starting in this verse. It says, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And so we discover a, a couple of things here. First, we realize that the new Christians identified themselves immediately with the church through being baptized. In hum and haw about it, they knew very clearly that they needed to be a part of the church because they were saved by Christ, and then they sought out baptism right away. Second, what is implied in this verse was membership in the church. And I say it's implied because it's not specific. But it is implied because there was an official accounting of who was saved and it was noted. The identification of the number of believers who were added to the church was rounded off to be about 3,000 souls. So this was a church full of the born again in response to the gospel preached, and it was marked by repentance and genuine faith, saving faith in action. They didn't say, wow, I'm saved, and then they just kind of did nothing. They, the first action, the first step of obedience for every Christian, even today, is baptism. And so they took action. They were faithful. They, they knew what the gospel was. They, they did it. And so we discover that the early Christian never thought about staying at an arm's length to the church. They valued the gospel. They loved Christ. They loved his church because they loved the Lord deeply. In verse 42, we are told that they were continually devoting themselves the Christians had a present active and ongoing role in the church, not a passive one, not, once again, an arm's length one, and especially not a non-existing one. It wasn't a pick and choose one either. And we should take note that the church members, as it says in this verse, uh, using the NASB translation, just kind of drawing out the Greek there, says, were continually devoting themselves. They were all in, in, as evidenced by their ongoing, repeated actions of devotion. It was also a church that was committed to the spiritual duties and privileges, as we found in verse, in verse 42. It says, the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so there was a high commitment which defined the life of each member of the church through learning from the word, enjoying the, the blessings of a common community, the grateful celebration and remembrance through the Lord's Supper, and the sweet communication with the Lord. And so this was a church that would have been effectively equipped to accomplish the will of God, even in the difficulties of their day of persecution. They clearly were committed in allegiance to Christ. They clearly understood their need to be spiritually disciplined. And so they understood that for church, they were all in, because that is part of the gospel. We don't come to Christ half-heartedly. When we truly come to the gospel of Christ, we are all in and nothing else. If you don't understand that this morning, you need to question if you are saved or not. Sounds harsh, but that is the demand of Christ. It is a loving command to bow down to him as God and Savior. Everything. We need to be all in. And so do you know what happened to this church? Because this church was alive to Christ, what happened was that being spiritually disciplined, we church, it inspired awe, as it says in verse 43. It says, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And that word awe in, in verse 43 has reference to, and it is so interesting, this word, 
It has a reference to holy terror. Holy terror due to the sense of divine presence. It generated reverence for the Holy One, God, manifesting in many wonders and signs which authenticated the message and the mission of the apostles. And so we discern that the church membership were blessed by this spiritually vibrant and supernatural quality of the life of the church. And such divine characteristic of the church had a tremendous impact upon both believers who were just stirred up even more in their excitement of new life in Christ. And it also affected the unbelievers for the gospel. That is the power of God when we are in line under him doing his will in the church. The spiritual discipline of church also resulted in a rich community life. And it says, it tells us in verses 44 to 46 that that community life, part of that aspect was sharing. And so it says, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So something more in these verses, in this passage, which is teaching us how to live our Christian life day to day, something that maybe we need to implement that we haven't been for a while, uh, this week perhaps even. And this church was one that lived in spiritual unity, In practice, practical oneness as the family of God. They excelled in sharing the resources that God had blessed them with, with one another, as anyone might have need. And so they found out somebody had a need. They said, hey, let me take care of that need. I'd love to minister to you because I love you. They weren't wrapped up in their jobs. They were wrapped up in Christ and one another. And these believers were like-minded in their attendance at the temple of God, having a strongly committed affiliation with the place of worship. And that place of worship for us is this building. The church's people, God has blessed us with this building. This is where we gather. It shouldn't be anything else. And this passage, once again, mentions breaking of bread from house to house. It could mean that they were uh, more than likely... They were breaking bread in this context from house to house, sharing a meal together. As it says, because it follows, they were taking their meals together. One thing I look forward to in this church is the fellowship and refreshment time, which has been reinstated recently after a worship time. And it's a meaningful way, if we think through this passage and just kind of think of uh, immediate application for us this morning to follow through with, It's a meaningful way uh, that we model some of the hard attitudes of the early church. So I encourage you to, you know, don't just get up and just leave. Maybe you have something planned right after this. Uh, My encouragement to you is don't plan anything after church. (laughs) Plan to stay, right? Plan to hang out. This is the Lord's day. You know, after you've done the things, I'm, I'm not saying don't do things and don't plan things afterward, but... This is the Lord's Day. This is the, the one day of, of, the, of the week. You have a whole week to do other things. The, the Lord didn't say this is the Lord's week. He says this is the Lord's Day. So out of his kindness, out of his graciousness, out of his understanding, he knows you're very, very busy. And so one of the, the meaningful things of this day and after church is that we, we go there. We go to the Vernon Hall and and enjoy the fellowship of one another, and, and secondary, enjoy some coffee and some refreshments. Right? That, that's what it's about. Um, like a mouse drawn to uh, food. <laughs> that's why we put the food there, I guess, to, to draw you over there for, for the real meaning of fellowship. But anyway, the result of such a Christ-honoring church was that it, it produced much joy. It says, gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And so we see that this church was a contagious church. 
infecting others with the selfless love of Christ. And so the final result was that the church grew numerically and spiritually through the testimony of the gospel lived out daily. And the, the Lord, as it says in verse 47, the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. When we live our lives for Christ, we do God's will according to his way, things happen. If you're sitting here and you've been here for years and years and you're wondering why nothing's happening at church, maybe we have to ask the question, why? Why is nothing happening in church? Maybe we have to ask ourselves that question reading this passage. And reading this passage, we could rightly, rightfully state that because they were spiritually disciplined in the matter of church, the Lord richly blessed them and also blessed them numerically. And this kind of church is rare today. It is rare today. I hate to say it, but that's a reality. In North America, the Canadian church, we just take too much for granted to the point that church doesn't matter anymore. When you're not at church, that's what you're saying. Church doesn't matter. Christ doesn't matter to me. I have to be harsh about this, but that's true. If you really think about it. A lack of the spiritual discipline in the church has led to our current stats on the church. So let's bring this down to our level and pose some, some questions, some, some food for thought, some reflection, some application. If you are indeed truly alive to God and his word, is this the kind of model uh, for sharing and fellowship taking place inside and outside of these four walls? Is that happening here? Because as I mentioned earlier, the church is not a building. The church is you, saved in Christ, people. Here are a couple of connected soul-searching questions that arise. Is this overwhelmingly happening in this church? Today, every Sunday, throughout the week, in the life of the ministry of this church, just as it is as we've seen in Acts chapter 2. Is it happening in this local church? And so if your answer is no or kind of to both of these questions, you know, the follow-up that you should be thinking of is what heart change must take place in each one of you that leads to actual actions in Christ's church, this church, to be more like the Acts chapter 2 church. And what are we doing well because we are doing things well. And what are things which need improvement for Christ's glory in this local church? A sermon, this sermon, any sermon, is to be implemented by you. We don't gather just to sit, sit and listen. We gather to learn. And learning incorporates action. And so the sermons are not mere academics. And so we need to get busy with God's will. We know God's will. And if you didn't this morning, now you know God's will for you. Going back to the ecclesiastical hitchhiker and churchless Christian scenarios in contrast to Acts 2, we should begin to see the dire fallout that such professed believers remain ineffective Christians until they realize the error of their attitudes towards Christ, towards his church, and why he has established her, Christ died for his church. And why he established her is that he might sanctify you, as it says in Ephesians 5, having cleansed you by the washing of water with the word that you might be holy and without blemish because we are members of his body. As we close, may you have been challenged, perhaps, hopefully certain encouraged to see what this church can be, to see, in contrast to the example of Acts chapter 2, the early church and our scripture passages, even from Hebrews, it might it spur you on as they affirm to us that we, the born again, are to have a biblically active relationship with the church because Jesus is the Lord. He is the head of this church.
And through the church, each one of you can foster being more spiritually disciplined, that we, that we will, all of us will uh, grow to become more Christ-like. And if you want to uphold the biblical doctrine of church, then there is no such thing as the independent Christian doing his or her own, own thing apart from the church body. And you must be present. We are all to be together and all in. And so may each one of us, as God's people here at OBC, also reaffirm in our hearts that by God's grace we have been granted a place, a place in the most glorious organism ever created on earth, and that is Christ's church. It's an organism because it's made up of each one of you who are in Christ. We are a living organism for him. We are a body for Christ, his body. And so if you love Jesus, you will value his church. And the question for each of us to think of and to meditate upon as we leave this place in a few moments, or actually many moments after fellowship, hint, hint, <laughs> is am I living up to my calling in Christ Jesus, the head of the church, by being spiritually disciplined as it pertains to his church? Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful. We're thankful because you always remind us through your word of where we ought to be. We are indeed well labeled as sheep. Because as we know, if we know sheep left in the field, they'll just stray. They'll go into other pastures where they're not supposed to be. They'll get distracted. They'll do things that they shouldn't. And we confess that's us no matter how mature we are. And so we're grateful for your word, which encourages us to see beyond maybe the, the way that we've viewed church, the way that we've really ultimately treated you in our relationship. And so, Lord, help us to meditate on your word, to reflect, and maybe even repent, to grow us in your will. Lord, what a blessing it is to be saved in Christ, to have new life in him, that once we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but through your grace you sent Christ into this world to die for our sins according to the scripture. And not only did he die, but he is the only one to be raised from the dead to live eternally as very man and very God that separates true Christianity from every single religion. And it also separates us because we know it's not a system of works. We're not trying to merit your salvation by trying to be good people because we aren't, even when we are saved. But you and your grace have declared us righteous in Christ when you saved us, when we repented of our sins. We had that change of mind toward our sin, and we saw things your way, as you've shown us in your word. And in that newness of Christ, we are transformed, we are regenerated, we have spiritual eyes, and we can live life to the fullest in the way that you've created us as our creator. And what a magnificent way to live in righteousness, in holiness. And what a responsibility, what privileges we have to be in this local church, to live out and to enjoy all those spiritual blessings that we've mentioned in this sermon this morning that you've told us. And so what else would we long for in this world? And yet you've blessed us with many things, many good things, because you are a perfect Father in heaven. 
who gives us wonderful gifts to enjoy. But sometimes we chase after those things more than we chase after Christ. So refresh us, Lord. Help us. Change us. Renovate us. Even as we renovate this building, preparing for more ministry and opportunities that you'll give us so that as we follow your will, Lord, that you might bless us numerically to fill these pews with people, your people, and those who need to hear the gospel. Lord, we are in awe. And we thank you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen.